dear students, this, this is part two of the Life Skills 3 presentation and we'll continue today with the Life Skills for the Senior Primary Phase, part two, and we'll look at career guidance in further detail. Now the first um, topic that I would like to stress is time management. In order to manage your time effectively, you need to have control over your life and you must make sure that time does not manage you. How do we go about to manage our time effectively? First of all, you need to be able to plan. That means you study your timetable, look at the subjects that you need to study and plan accordingly which day and time will be set aside for that. In the next place, we'll look at revision. Revision, of course, is very important and it needs to be done every day on the work that has been discussed during the school hours. You need to um, help learners to draw up notes so that they can remember what has been done and what has been said in class. Then we go to the day before the examination. It is crucial that learners know where they will write, what they should bring along with them and what time the examination will start. On the day of the examination, you need to teach your students or your learners to have a very good breakfast which will provide them with energy to tackle the day, to be on time and not to be, and it's too late to start studying the day before the time. That's also something um, very crucial. Topics that you forgot at that time, you should not concentrate on anymore, rather focus on what you are well prepared for. Then there are different examination skills that we can teach learners in the life skills periods. First of all, learners should be able to know what their learning style is. We distinguish firstly between a visual learning style, which means that the learner predominantly studies by using his or her eyes. In other words, this type of learner prefers to watch a practical demonstration. The next type of learning style is auditory learning. And with this style, the student needs to hear what the teacher has to say. He or she might also often ask the teacher to repeat what has been taught in class. The kinesthetic learning style refers to the type of learner who prefers to move around while he or she learns. This type of learner cannot learn by sitting still, but would rather learn by doing things practically. When learners know what their learning style is, it can really assist them to practice in studying more effectively and their learning style will benefit them if they know what to concentrate on. The next topic. There's a strong link between your subject choice at school as well as your career. When a learner chooses the wrong subject, it will influence the learner's future. And sometimes this can be very negative. There are compulsory subjects in grade 8, but there are also other subjects that a learner can choose from. Now, the life skill teacher plays a very important role here. He or she needs to assist the learner to do some research on which subject they will need for their future careers. You also need to consider the school the learner is going to apply to if those specific subjects will be offered at the school. Then the learner should also consider his or her interests, skills as well as personality. When learners go to senior secondary school, they should concentrate on choosing subjects that will enable them to work from their strengths, which will challenge them to make the most of their capabilities and which would also provide them with a qualification to pursue their career and ambitions after school. Of course, it's also important that these are subjects that the learners enjoy and are interested in. There's a range of st um, study opportunities available, but it depends very strongly on which subject the learner chose at school. You should also apply the fact that the learner should be provided with life skills with the subjects that he or she chooses. Then, once more, must make very sure that the choices are that of the learner and not something that the parent or the teacher wants the learner to choose. 
we continue with the next topic and this also focuses strongly on career guidance but particularly on how the teacher should go about in preparing for lessons. Why do we prepare for lessons? Because it promotes planning as well as learning. The main ideas of the topic should be included and learners have to like what they are going to do and we also need to know what their needs are. You should include the logical details of the topic and also make sure that you have the necessary materials and equipment that needs to be used during each lesson. The tasks that are prepared should be assessing the learner and you should choose in advance the criteria that you are going to use during the assessment. Learning goals need to be considered for each lesson that you prepare. What is meant by a learning goal is that it's an outcome of the topic and these have to include concepts, attitudes, as well as social and personal responsibility. The reasons for teaching a specific topic is you need to build upon what the learner already knows and then offer content that the learner still should be able to master. You should be aware of how these topics correlate with one another and also how the topic addresses the curriculum guidelines. Consider all sources that are available to support you in your teaching and the, and the learning of your learners. Consider the sequence of activities that will promote learning best. And then we go on and we look at preparing for a lesson and there are three main aspects to consider there. Those are the learners, the lesson and the assessment. When it comes to preparing the lesson, if we consider the learner, as I said previously, you need to know what your learners already know and then figure out how you are going to build upon the previous knowledge they have. You must make sure that the presentation will accommodate all the learners in class, thus your special learners should also be included. And you also need to consider what will the learners work on or think about when they conclude the tasks they need to do about a certain topic. Then when we look at the lesson specifically, how will this lesson build on previous lessons and how will it prepare the learner for future lessons? Also consider in the lesson what might the learners find easy and what might be a bit more challenging for them. You need to consider possibilities of what might happen during a lesson as well as the specific sequence that you will follow in presenting the content. Also plan ahead um, how much time you are going to devote to the introduction, the content, the activities as well as the conclusion. Last of all under the lesson content, think of the kind of questions you can ask learners to assess whether they have mastered the content and whether they fully understand the topic that was presented. When it comes to assessment, you should plan specific tasks that you are going to assess. You will be assessing the learner's skills and knowledge on a specific topic. We spoke about criteria in the previous um, session that we had and now it, it's very important that you choose appropriate criteria to assess the learner's knowledge and skills for the specific lesson. We need to keep track of learner's progress um, and that we do as we said by using a class list and indicating the specific learners that are assessed marks on the different skills that they were assessed in. Very importantly, if you look at the bottom of the screen, lesson presentations have to be done in advance and they should be properly dated in ink. The date on the lesson preparation form should always correlate with a completion date on the scheme of work. A next topic in a different domain that we also need to look at is daily living skills. One of the daily living skills learners need to be familiar with is healthy eating habits and the steps to develop healthy eating habits. 
A second more important topic according to me is to look at HIV AIDS, specifically in how HIV AIDS is spread and how it can be treated. Now when we look at how HIV AIDS is spread, we know that this is important in the sense that it is something that is increasing among our young people in Namibia and the main way that it is spread is through unprotected sex. It can also spread from mother to child during pregnancy at birth, also through breastfeeding and then in some cases children are also infected due to sexual abuse. How does HIV AIDS spread? It does not spread by having skin to skin contact. The only way it can spread is through body fluids. Here the body fluids we are talking about is the blood, the semen, vaginal fluid as well as the breast milk of the HIV infected mother. Sharing needles when using drugs is also another cause of spreading HIV AIDS. And important to note, the mother to child transmission takes place during labor, birth or breastfeeding. And less commonly, when you donate blood, it's very unlikely that it can happen, but there is always a possibility, of course. Something that's interesting to note is that HIV AIDS can be contracted by chewing food that has been chewed by another person. Um, how does this happen? If you have a little sore in your mouth, um, the blood of the infected person can mix with the food while chewing and then he or she can transmit the virus to you. If you share a razor, obviously if there's a cut and some blood comes onto the razor, that can then again be transmitted to you if you have any open sore or cut on your body. The stages of HIV infection. If we look at these, first of all, the first symptoms that will be experienced will be swollen glands and those are usually in the throat, the armpits and the groin. A person that has contracted HIV might have a slight fever, a headache, fatigue as well as muscle pain. The symptoms may last for a few weeks and then they may disappear completely. Also important, it happens that some people have no symptoms at all and that is a big reason why many people don't realize that they are HIV positive. Something that can prevent HIV AIDS from spreading is emergency HIV drugs. But they need to be administered 72 hours after, the, after it has been spread to you. And it is done by post-exposure prophylaxis, also called PEP. It may stop the person from becoming infected, but it's not 100% safe or 100% sure that it will prevent HIV AIDS. These um, prophylaxis need to be taken for a month and it also has serious side effects. And as I said, they are not guaranteed to work. Then the antiretroviral drugs that are used to treat HIV AIDS. You can go through treatment during pregnancy because this will especially help you to prevent the baby from being infected with HIV AIDS. The statistics say that without treatment, one in four babies from HIV AIDS positive mothers will develop HIV AIDS. But with treatment of the antiretroviral drug, you can reduce that risk from um, ha having one in four chances to one in a hundred. Another technique that is used when people are HIV AIDS, HIV AIDS positive is a process called sperm wash washing. What this basically means is that the mother and the father receive treatment, which makes it possible for the mother to conceive and have a child without the risk of HIV AIDS infection. Like we said, the drugs that we use to treat HIV AIDS has some side effects that can be very unpleasant. These include nausea, tiredness, skin rashes, mood swings, gaining weight, just maybe on one part of the body while losing it at, a, at another, and it also includes diarrhea. Let's have a quick look at HIV. It's an infection that causes AIDS. Some people have no symptoms for up to 10 years before they develop AIDS. 
It is spread during unprotected sex or contact with infected blood. And the best prevention against HIV AIDS would be to use condoms, both male and female condoms. How should we behave towards people that are living with HIV AIDS? We know there's a lot of stigma and discrimination surrounding HIV AIDS, which can very negatively affect the HIV AIDS positive person. We should teach our learners that an HIV positive person often feels very alone, isolated and even frightened because the future is so unsure. They need very good friends to lean on and to trust. And the first thing that you can assist them with is to gain more information on HIV and also to, ass to assist in stopping possible rumours about them. We should teach our learners to develop empathy for others. Empathy means to put yourself in others' shoes, to think how you would feel if someone would behave towards you in such a way. Acceptance is important. We should accept each and every person for who he or she is. Once again, if learners know that HIV AIDS is only spread through human body fluids, it can do a lot to reassure them and to make them more comfortable to interact with other HIV positive people. If an HIV positive person feels sick, we should be there for them, we should be able to assist them. But then again, once again, if you are working with a person who is HIV positive, it's always important to wear gloves to protect yourself from the person's body fluids. We should take care of our community members. Every sick person in the community should be lended a, a helping hand, and that includes people with HIV AIDS. Listen to the HIV positive person's fears and try to understand why their fears, even if it sounds unrealistic, we should try to listen and be understanding. It's very important that a HIV positive person is motivated to live a healthy lifestyle and to take his or her medication regularly and on time. Let me just go back to that to conclude. Um, by taking the medication on time and by living a healthier life, you will be able to be productive for many, many years and you are able to live a life without any complications as any other normal person would be. Now we have a look at substance abuse and addiction, which can be a real threat to our young learners. What is the definition of abuse? It's the misuse of any drug. It can be either alcohol, medication or even inhalants. And these are used to alter the mood of the person who is using it. One substance, um, one example of something that is abused very regularly by not only by our young people but especially um, in the senior phase is cigarettes. We know that the nicotine in cigarettes is very addictive. It is legal to smoke cigarettes but it has become illegal to smoke it in any government office, inside shops or restaurants. It is even dangerous for non-smokers and that is what we need to focus on. A non-smoker might inhale the, the second-hand smoke and this can cause breathing problems and even lung cancer. In addition, cigarettes are very expensive and this can even contribute to people not having enough money to buy the necessities they need. Chain smokers' teeth generally become yellow and they develop bad breath which is also very undesirable. Like we said, it contributes to diseases, lung as well as heart disease. Unfortunately, smokers find it very difficult to stop once they have started. So therefore, it's better to teach learners to never ever even start smoking in order to avoid all these problems. Uh, medication abuse. We know that it's very easy to get medication over the counter and Many of these medications are also dangerous. It doesn't mean if it's available over the counter that it does not have serious side effects to abuse them. The prescribed medicine that people receive is only safe for the person whom it is prescribed for. 
Sometimes people share medication. This is very dangerous to another person's life and can even lead to death. Something that is very often abused if we look at medication is headache tablets and cough syrups. As they seem harmless, but they, they contain very strong chemicals that, that on the long run may cause your kid, kidneys to, to get damaged and also causes heart failure. A well-known drug to everyone, I believe, is dacha. It's also known as marijuana, pot, weed, grass, etc. And it's generally known as a gateway drug. That means it's very easily available in general. If you are looking for it, you'll be able to find it. And also that it usually leads to the use of other harmful drugs. What does dacha or marijuana do to you? It changes the working of the brain and the user experiences are high and it makes it difficult for the, for the, the user to move or to think as everything seems to be moving slower. The vision and the hearing of a user may be distorted and he or she may struggle with concentration. When learners smoke dacha, they generally fail examination, they start doing poorly in sport because it leads to um, the decline of motivation to learn and to do well at school. Another big risk is that people may lose their inhibitions when they smoke dacha, which generally may lead to risky sexual behavior. And if we look at what the smoking of, of dacha can cause to the body, we can look at the following. As we said, people become less interested in school and sport. Usually users, regular users, I'm not talking about a once-off user, will have red and swollen eyes as well as blurred vision. A person might behave strangely, for instance, giggle or do silly things that don't make sense. The person will struggle with his or her memory. The person might be very sleepy in class and he or she might also constantly be coughing. In the long run, using dacha or smoking dacha also leads to lung cancer. It also lowers the immune system because it damages the cells in the body. In certain users, it might cause aggressiveness. It may also lead to hallucinations. Importantly, all of these effects are not um, true for every person, it differs from user to user. Last of all, the loss of inhibitions, which we said, which then leads to the risky sexual behavior among youngsters. Alcohol abuse. Alcohol abuse is a very important topic in life skills, especially considering the social problems we experience in Namibia. There are also other drugs that one can refer to and teach the learner about. They include for instance, mandrax and ecstasy. What is the effect of you, these drugs? They cause a high, as they say, and often cause people to feel more open towards others and towards doing certain things. In, thus, they feel less shy. And that is what's the appeal to many, many users. Often, after using dacha and mandrax or ecstasy, learners can't quite remember what happened or how things exactly happened while they were under the influence. And the important thing that sums up the danger is that it harms the brain function and that it influences person's judgment and coordination. The blurred vision, as we said, is also apparent here. People might become unconscious. When you use ecstasy, you will have a very high pulse rate. Sometimes these things can lead to seizures and once again, you damage the kidney and the liver, and it leads to breathing problems as well. In very severe cases, drug users or substance abusers may even die, particularly if they overdose by accident. Then there's something known as club drugs, and this is the so-called date rape drug, when something is thrown into the young person's drink, and afterwards, after the rape might have occurred, the person may have only back flashes but cannot really remember anything that happened. But then why do people use or abuse 
substances if it's so harmful. Let's have a look. A lot of times it can be due to peer pressure. People, especially young people, have a very strong need to be part of a group and then they tend to follow what others in the group are doing. Once again, we can also say that a youngster might want to experience or experiment um, a part of the adult world and they might see using these substances as being an adult thing to do. Some learners come from broken homes and also homes which are char characterized by gender-based violence and sometimes learners are even under very extreme pressure to perform and they feel that by using these drugs it alleviates the stress they are under. When a learner feels insecure or overly pressurized, using these drugs help them to escape emotionally from the situation that they are in. Then we must not forget the impact the media sometimes has on the behavior of young people. Many movies, many TV programs um, show the abuse or the misuse of substances and it appears cool to young learners. You follow these examples because they might think that this is the norm. There's nothing wrong with it. Another serious topic that we discuss with learners in life skills is the topic of child abuse, neglect and molestation. Let's have a look at the definition of the above. Now, when we say that somebody is physically emotionally or sexually abused, it refers to the maltreatment but also to the neglect of the child. And neglect means it's any act or failure to act on the part of the caregiver which might result in the child's death or physical or emotional harm or lastly the sexual exploitation of a child. The first type of abuse that we look at is physical abuse. Now in physical abuse there's a physical aggression that's directed to, um, at the child by the adult or caregiver because he or she deliberately wants to cause serious injury. Or it might be that he or she places the child in a situation where he or she risks serious injury or even death. How do we recognize learners who are physically abused. Often you will see that these learners might have repeated bruises, they might have scratches on their skin, they might have burn marks. In some serious cases there might be broken bones or fractures and you also might see that a learner has different um, types of sores or, or um, burns that are in a different, uh, different stages of healing. Sexual abuse. Now this is when an adult or even an older youth abuses the child for sexual stimulation or physical gratification. But it's also when the child is exploited sexually for financial profit. And it includes pressurizing the child to engage in sexual activities. Now the, the effects of sexual abuse on the child is very, very severe we can say it's even more so than in the case of physical abuse. The child might experience extreme feelings of guilt, self-blame, there might be nightmares, um, the inability to sleep and also some flashbacks which, which causes severe anxiety. The child will fear anything that's associated with sexual abuse. This might be the police, um, doctors or even a certain smell or clothes that somebody is wearing. The person generally has a low self-worth and also other behavioral problems start to manifest like depression, aggression, apathy as well as regression. Mental illnesses in the severest cases might include schizophrenia, borderline personality disorder, um, suicidal ideation, post-traumatic stress disorder and then you also get the effect that the person um, develops an eating disorder such as bulimia or anorexia. How can we recognize these um, signs, the physical signs in learners? What we can look out for is 
that people usually, if you ex see that a learner experiences problems to sit or walk, sometimes there can be bruises around the genitals. Um, and in that case, it might be difficult. But if you suspect that a learner is abused, it is important that he or she is referred to get a medical examination to determine what the situation is. Now, we all know the last bullet, if you look at that on the slide, that mostly the victims are very well known to their offenders, which complicates the matters even more. The emotional abuse that we talk about, this includes a wide range, um, starting from loud yelling at a child or a young learner, to coarse and rude attitude towards the person, up to being very um, critical of a person and belittling the person. Now, what does a child do that is emotionally abused? He usually tries to protect himself or herself by distancing um, himself from the abuser. But he might also internalize the abuse and fight back with insulting words. The learner tends to suffer from self-blame, low self-worth, and also might become passive, and you find that these learners often avoid eye contact. The next type of abuse is neglect. Now, neglect is when the caregiver, which is the responsible parent, does not provide in the child's needs. And these include the care, the love, the shelter, the medical care, and the supervision that the child needs, and also, it, he or she does not give the child the attention that he or she needs. What happens when a child is neglected? Very often, they drop out of school, where they are then have to resort to stealing food or begging for food and for money to stay alive. These children often lack medical and dental care, and they might be dirty, and you might see that these children lack sufficient clothing for the weather, like in winter they might be very scantily dressed. They experience delays in physical and psychosocial development and they'll generally have impaired language as well as impaired memory and social skills. A learner that's neglected feels very insecure, also has a low self-esteem and might show aggression as well as hyperactive behavior. He or she will struggle to form healthy relationships with others and will generally distrust people's good intentions. How can we help these learners to cope with the abuse that they've been through? There's no standard way in which a child reacts to abuse. So we really need to look at each of these learners as individuals because their reaction will be shaped by their personality as well as the other environmental factors they are exposed to. It will vary if we look at the gender and the age, as well as the siblings um, in the family. And even two siblings from the, the same family will not cope and respond to abuse in the exact same way. Many children develop coping strategies um, because they need to do this in order to protect themselves. And they often feel very strongly about protecting their family as well. Therefore, they hide what is going on. Children know the number of emergency services generally as it is taught at school, and many of them actually do call for help or contact the police or other services. Some children try to cope with abuse by disengaging. In other words, they totally isolate themselves from what's going on around them. Or they might even fantasize when they are older and show more external behaviors such as truancy and telling lies. The bad part of it is that an abused child often blames him or herself and they often think that they deserve being abused. The way that boys cope with abuse is different um, than girls would do. They are more likely to exhibit outward expression and this then comes about when they show aggression and bad behavior, and they might even use violence, whereas girls tend to bottle up all their emotions and feelings inside. This, of course, then leads to 
um, being anxious, becoming depressed, and also once again having a very low self-esteem. Girls are more likely also to engage in self-harm and they are especially prone to developing eating disorders after being abused. What is very important and you need to, to look at that in your study guide is how the adult, the parent, the teacher or the caring person who is there for the child reacts when the abuse is reported. Now something totally different that we need to look at as well is that we need to teach learners how to set up a budget. When we set up a budget, we need to indicate the money that we have to use. So in other words, what is the income that we are working with? It can come from the salary or any other sources of income that's available to us. The monthly expenses need to be listed. Usually you start with the bigger expenses and you work it down to the less serious or the least important expenses in the end. You need to estimate or be able to develop the skill of estimating how much money you are going to use. You um, can use um, a record sheet to indicate these and it's also important to determine what are the essential things that need to be bought, these, uh, the necessities and where you are able to cut back a bit if your budget doesn't allow it. There should be two separate budget lists in this sense, one for the essential things you need every month and then one for the extras, the luxuries as we call it. You need to be able to prioritize what needs to be paid. For example, something we have to do each month is the water, the rent and the electricity. Then have a look at your total expenses and your income and decide where you can save or is there some money that you can set aside after everything has been paid? You should review your budget regularly and determine whether your income has become more or your expenses less. Sometimes it will be necessary to compromise because unexpected expenses might arise so there should always be a bit of money put aside for these cases. You should know what is really necessary and what are the things that you actually just want. And you will see that there's a very good example of a form that you can write your budget on and determine in each column what is necessary um, to put aside for each month, what are the main expenses, etc. So please be sure that you are able to set up or complete such a budget form as the example in the guide shows you. Now we move over to different types of diseases we should teach our learners about. Now hepatitis is also quite a common disease in Namibia and it refers to the inflammation of the liver cells. It's a viral infection and it's usually um, aggravated by alcohol, toxins and infections and what happens is the liver swells and it can lead to very serious liver damage even resulting eventually in liver cancer. There are different types of hepatitis. Hepatitis A is usually caused by eating or drinking infected food or water that contains the virus or it can also be um, spread through oral or anal contact during sex but what is significant to note is that practically each person who develops hepatitis A is able to make a full recovery. Hepatitis B is contracted in the same way that HIV AIDS is, by being in contact with infected bodily fluids. Then hepatitis C, it also occurs when somebody has been in direct contact with the blood of a person who has hepatitis C. The symptoms of hepatitis is also a mild flu-like illness. You might have a mild fever, feel nauseous, vomit, have diarrhea. Um, people who are infected experience a loss of appetite and have a muscle, muscle or joint aches. Also, there might be some slight abdominal pains and weight loss as well. When the symptoms become acute, that means more serious, you will experience that your urine is dark, you feel very drowsy, you might have severe headaches, hives, 
on the skin might develop an enlarged spleen when it's in alcoholic hepatitis your skin will also become itchy and your feces is light colored and people with hepatitis when it moves over to um, the acute stage might even have a yellow skin color how can we treat hepatitis there isn't a very specific treatment for this disease most important is that the infected person rests follows a diet high in protein and carbohydrates because this will aid in repairing the damaged liver cells. He or she can also use an antiviral that can be, be prescribed by the doctor. To prevent hepatitis is very important. We really need to um, teach our learners and also remind ourselves to wash our hands with soap and water very regularly, especially after going to the toilet. And when we eat food, um, consider whether it's well cooked. Make sure that the water you are drinking is very clean. If you are unsure, rather cook the food and boil the water that you need to use. So sanit sanitation is very important in preventing hepatitis. Um, and then we can also get a vaccine against hepatitis A specifically, which will prevent us from contracting this disease. Next is not a specific disease or a common disease but that we are looking at, but a common phenomena, a common social problem that we need to deal with in our society, and that is rape. The definition of rape is that it's a sexual activity to which you do not freely give your consent. It includes any penetration, whether it might be very slight of the vagina, the anus, or the mouth, or any other body part or object against a per person's will. With any other body part, excuse me. Now, we distinguish between different kinds of rape. One of these um, is statuary rape, and what this refers to is when somebody has sexual intercourse with a person under a certain age. And the age will usually differ from country to country and it's specified by the law of each country. There's also something like marital rape, which we don't consider often, but it's something very serious. This means that the sex was non-consensual and the perpetrator is the victim's spouse. And it's often linked with domestic violence as well. The effects of rape are very severe. Let's have a look. Victims that are raped are very traumatized by the assault and they often have difficulty functioning after this has happened. In school, they will, or in the work situation, wherever, they will struggle to concentrate, have difficulty to sleep, might experience nightmares, and the eating habits might change completely. These people feel on edge the whole time. They suffer from depression, and even experience post-traumatic stress disorder. They find, to, find it very difficult to deal with the memories of the event. Many people will find it difficult to reveal what has happened to them, even to family or friends, and that's why we get that many people, after they've been raped, they do not report it to the police, and they do not even seek medical assistance. There's severe anxiety, that occurs after this incident and the person might also start to avoid any social contact. Then the worst or one of the, the worst scenarios might be that the person becomes HIV infected or even becomes pregnant and this HIV virus is then transferred to the baby. Then in some cultures the member, sorry, the, the victim of the rape might be forced by family members to actually marry the rapist to save their reputation because there's always the stigma after a person has been raped that now the girl has been tarnished in some way or maybe it's a type of girl who has a reputation for risky sexual behavior and this might be totally untrue. Every rape should be reported and people should be encouraged to report rape. How do we go about? Because it's one of the most underreported violent crimes, we need to address this. 
with our young learners to be prepared and also to be prepared to assist somebody who might have been the subject of rape. The initiation and the process of the rape investigation totally depends on whether the victim is, is willing to report the, the, um, the rape and to describe the rape to the police. In such cases, it is advisable that a close friend or family member is called as soon as possible to assist the person in reporting the rape and also that the person is taken to a doctor or a clinic for examination, medical examinations. Biological evidence needs to be preserved if we wish to, to get evidence against the perpetrator and these include the semen, the blood, vaginal secretions, all bodily fluids, so to speak, and this is usually collected by a rape kit and then identified in a laboratory. And this is how it determines whether the sexual contact actually occurred and this is how they will catch the perpetrator in the end. Victims of rape must know that they shouldn't go to the toilet, shower, bath or even brush their teeth after the rape. They should keep on the same clothing that they had on because all of this will need to be used to take examples of the saliva and other bodily fluids. What happens is the victim changes his or her clothes. You should know that you should put it in a paper bag and not a plastic bag because if it's placed in plastic some of the chemicals might destroy the, the possible evidence that might be found. A victim of rape should ask for the day after pill to prevent any possibility of pregnancy and also of course take emergency treatment for HIV AIDS and other STDs. How difficult it might be, the person should try to answer as many questions as possible. It's advisable also for the victim to go for counselling after this incident because this is not the type of occurrence that can generally be handled effectively on your own. Learner pregnancy is another very relevant topic in our Namibian schools. We need to teach every learner what the facts are about pregnancy and then also make them aware of what the problems are they are going to face when becoming pregnant when still at school. Abortion goes hand in hand with learner pregnancy. We know that abortion refers to the termination of a pregnancy when the fetus is removed from the uterus. It's still illegal in Namibia to perform abortions and abortion has very serious consequences legally, physically and emotionally. Sometimes it might be legal to perform an abortion and this is when the mother's life is in danger or when there's a mental illness in either the mother or the father if the fetus has a mental illness or of course when the mother has been raped or there's proof of incest. Backstreet abortions because of the fact that it's not legal to abort babies many people re, um, go and have a backstreet abortion but it has severe consequences. In some cases it has caused a woman's cervix to become inflamed. It can lead to serious pelvic inflammatory diseases. Sometimes the uterus is perforated and the bladder and the bowels can also be hurt by the sharp objects that they use in abortions. Damage to the cervix lining can occur due to tearing and the, the person who has had an abortion might have uncontrolled bleeding as well. Septicemia is something that might occur due to unsterile instruments and this can cause death when it's not treated quickly enough as we said. There are also psychological consequences of having an abortion. Trauma, depression, guilt, shame and also having problems with future relationships. Next, part of the life skills, part of our daily living skills that we should acquire is something called assertive behavior. What is the definition? Being neither passive nor aggressive when interacting with other people. 
being forthright, but also being positive and knowing your rights and standing up for your personal rights. A person who's assertive is able to express his or her thoughts, feelings and beliefs in an honest and appropriate way. This person will also be able to act in his or own best interest without feeling anxious about it. He or she has respect for others' beliefs, thoughts and feelings and has a balanced response being neither passive nor aggressive towards others. Assertive An assertive person is willing to give other people a chance to take charge. He or she doesn't always have to be in charge and they will address a problem and question rules or traditions that seem unfair. The person is usually relaxed and has an open posture, is able to keep eye contact when talking to, one, to someone else, as opposed to a person that's passive. A person that's passive usually has a lack of self-confidence and will simply agree with the wishes of another. And this generally undermines the person's individual rights as well as their self-confidence. Another opposite of being assertive would be aggressiveness. Now people who are aggressive rather than assertive always feel the need that they have to show themselves because they generally have a low self-esteem. They tend to speak loudly and they'll also glare at people and are hostile towards others. Another personal social skill that has to be dealt with in the life skills class is emotions. Now we know that we all have a range of emotions and not all of these emotions are always dealt with effectively. What is an emotion? It's a feeling a person experiences when certain chemicals are released in the brain. We have different emotions every day and we need to acquire the skills to deal with these properly. Especially the teenager's body um, changes so radically and hormones develop that they really experience a range of emotions, sometimes even without a real reason or knowing why. Mood swings occur when these teenagers develop emotionally and as they strive to become independent, they might have more conflict with their caregivers or parents and their emotions play havoc with them. People surrounding us have a strong influence on our emotions. So therefore it's always important to rather surround yourself with positive people. How can we teach learners to cope with emotions? You should go through that part in your guide, especially how to to handle anger and stress in our lives. Now, anger and stress can lead to depression. And I want to focus on depression in this, set, this session. The signs of depression are vast. There are many signs to look out for. Tiredness, struggling to sleep, being irritable, um, feelings of numbness or listlessness, the eating disorders, not being able to concentrate, etc. So they are both physical as well as psychological signs that can show you that a person is depressed. When you experience any of the above feelings that are listed there, then you know that it's necessary to go for counseling because there is help for depression. Another emotional um, feeling or situation that learners need to be able to deal with is a crisis. Now, when you experience a crisis, it's not necessarily a tra traumatic situation or event, but it's your reaction to a certain event that causes the crisis. One person might feel very deeply traumatized by an event that another person might suffer very little from. A crisis can only be seen as an opportunity to grow if you choose it to be. There are different types of crisis, technological, organizational, etc. And what happens if we are chronically exposed to stress or trauma? This leads to mental illness and a person might need counseling to deal with the situation. How do we cope with, with a crisis? First of all, you need to check whether you are physically safe, get me medical, psychological or legal help if needed. 
A vulnerable person might need somebody around him to protect or shelter him. And you also need to say to yourself that you need to switch off at times. You need to exercise to stay alert, but also try and relax when necessary. Keep pleasurable things in your life and maintain a healthy life by eating and sleeping well. Good nutrition is important to ensure a healthy body. You should also ensure that you get a good night's sleep and lend a helping hand to somebody who has to cope with crisis. Be alert always for the signs of depression and seek medical help where necessary. A next very important aspect is respect. Respect is an attitude and it's not the same as obedience. What do we mean by having respect? A learner can be obedient because he or she fears the teacher, but he or she can still have no respect for the person. Respect generally has to be earned. Children do what they see and not what they hear. That's why it's so important that parents and teachers remember that they are the role models that children are going to follow. Children need to respect, sorry, children need to experience respect to understand how important it is. A respectful child will take care of his or her belongings as well as the property of others. Being respectful helps one to be successful in life. It's almost impossible to be successful if you do not have respect both for both authority as well as your peers. When it comes to children and respect, please note the following. Parents have more influence than schools on how respectful children become. Unfortunately, many children do not have parents and grow up in child-headed households. Therefore, it becomes the teacher's job to teach learners about respect. Um, Cole? Can I keep sorry about that? Okay. To teach learners respect, it's very important that teachers need to be honest. If he or she does wrong, it's always important to admit the mistake as well as to apologize. Trust. Learners need to be allowed to make choices and take responsibility for their own actions. We as teachers should trust them to make the right choices. Fairness is very important. Always listen to the learner side of the story before reaching a conclusion. Politeness. Learners should understand the importance of the word thank you and please, and this should be demonstrated by the teacher to the learners. Reliable. Teachers should be, be reliable in the sense that they should keep their promises and show that they mean what they say. A teacher should be patient. Allow learners time to do their tasks and to make mistakes without reprimanding them. Be good listeners and give a learner the chance to say what they feel and listen to them attentively. Being a role model is very important because children learn by observing what the teacher does. Be caring, show concern for your learners, for animals as well as the environment. Show respect to authority by following rules and obeying the law. And self-respect. This is demonstrated through personal values, the way that we dress and the way that we behave. We should encourage our learners to take care of themselves properly. Last of all, and this concludes um, the aspect of respect, Teachers who yell and throw tantrums do not earn the respect of learners. It is better to be calm and patient, listen to your learners, understand them and care for them. Thank you.